pa, boom pa, doom pa dee doo. I've got another puzzle for you. Boom pa, boom pa, doom pa dee dee. If you are wise, you'll listen to me. Volunteers um, interbred with the uh, ground people and produce the little people. Okay, guys, welcome back to the Grimerica Show. We're going to be talk- talking with Susan B. Martinez, a PhD, a little bit later on. Um, and our RPJ is going to join us for the intro here. But first, as always, how's it going, Graham? Hey, I'm doing good, Darren. I'm recording from the Igloo 2, or we're doing non-local, and I'm talking on the Yeti. Twiglu. Quiglu? Twiglu. <laughs> like twin igloo, Twiglu. Oh, okay, that's cool. I just made that up. <laughs> How are you doing? Good. Uh, How are you excited. doing, Red Pill Junkie? Yeah. Hey, guys, how's it going? I'm doing fantastic, and I started the year with the right foot uh, and on January the 5th, I had the chance to have a, a little conversation with one of my idols in this field, Greg Bishop on Radio Misterioso, which was something about a dream come true because I've been fan of that show for many, many years. And then to be on the other side of the, you know, now being the guest in that was, at first I was incredibly nervous, but it, it, it turned out fantastic, you know, the, I like uh, just like the conversations we tend to have here on the Great America show. Right on, man. That's good. I'm happy for you. Yeah, I, I, like I said, I'm about three quarters of the way through it. I, I'll finish up on my drive into work tomorrow. So, what yeah, did you guys saying, talk about? What did we talk about it, man? Everything. Yeah, well, everything, anything, anything uh, the, interesting, like specific, sort of? Well, the nature of God. <laughs> <laughs> maybe the nature of UFOs or maybe whether we should be really obsessed with the nature of UFOs or maybe we should just be thankful of that the fact that ufology as a discipline or a hobby or a passion or whatever you however you want to uh, label it it uh, can help you to improve yourself as a person wow the discipline yeah maybe a discipline you know it's a it's a Okay, it's a hobby, you know, but it's a hobby that if you do it the right way, you get to learn about everything from astronomy, biology, physics, uh, anti-gravity propulsion. Yeah, and religion, mythology, psychology, uh, everything you can imagine, you know. And not only that, but like I told Greg, you know, the most important thing about mythology is that it should force you to re-examine and trying to redefine your concept of reality. Yeah, I like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think. I, um, I, yeah, go ahead. I think it was a good. I think it was like two hours almost, isn't it? Yeah, two hours. Yeah, yeah, and it's a good I'm long going chat. To, yes, the fact was so long that Greg told me that he didn't get to the to even half of the questions that he had lined up for me, you know, from him and also from some people that uh, wrote on his Facebook page. So I'm going to come back uh, this Sunday at uh, 10 p.m. I think it's uh, on my, well, the 10 p.m. my time. I think it's uh, 8 p.m. Uh, on Easter Standard Time, I, I'm not sure. You, you should check it on on the Radio Misterioso webpage. Yeah, so this is a Radio Misterioso, right? Is it live? There's a is. Yes, it's a live feed from uh, KGR Radio. KGRA Radio. Yes. Oh, okay. The same one as Mike and Scotty. Yeah, and uh, Chase mm-hmm. Klotsky. No, that's that's the global. Oh, okay. So maybe I'm mixing this up, you know. Maybe That's okay. We'll, just... we'll link, we'll link we'll to f- it in the we'll show notes. We'll so. track it down. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. That's good. Let's... Part two, you think there'll be a part three? <laughs> Who knows, man? I guess I mean, we're I... on like part ten. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I had such a 
great time with Greg that I wouldn't mind, you know, go, go coming back, you know, once every, I don't know, two or three months, uh, if he's, <laughs> it's all right with him, you know. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. I mean, even uh, I, it seems that even uh, the guys from the Paracas, you know, Jim, Jim Stivern and Chris, uh, Chris O'Brien is are interested in having me also as a guest on on the, on the show. Oh yeah, G uh, Chris is a huge fan of yours. Yeah, yeah, and also I think this is a good time to point out that the guys at the Paracas are having some type of financial trouble. I think that they're having a problem with their their, uh, their network that uh, broadcasts the show, and they're having some type of uh, Kickstarter funding, you know. And if if you're listening to this and you have uh, listened sometimes to 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 the podcast uh, podcast, and chances are that you have because they are they've been around so, for so many years and they have all sorts of very very important guests and in my in my case I, I i can easily say that they were instrumental in 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 my study and the formation of uh, uh, of all these topics so if you can uh, work a few dollars uh, on their way you know uh, i think they will uh, appreciate it appreciate it greatly you know maybe we should try to get a link to to the kickstarted campaign they're they're having yeah we'll do we'll do that for sure the paracast is a good uh good podcast if you like the the real sort of balanced skeptical angle like those guys are pretty um you know yeah they're, they make they're health they're healthily skeptical in their in their outlook mm -hmm. you know but they, yeah. they push their guests pretty hard to to provide evidence and all that so and yeah, they're I mean, very they very feel... knowledgeable yeah, definitely, you know, Gene, she's been around in this field for I don't know how many decades. And with Chris, he's been a full time uh, paranormal investigator, you know, on the San, Fern San Luis Valley, I think it is. Yeah, San Luis Valley, yeah. yeah. San Luis the Valley, four, you know. Four corners, yeah. Exactly, you know, studying everything from uh, cattle mutilations to UFO sightings to God knows what else. So, I mean, they got, the guys know their shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll make sure and link to that for uh, for sure. And if anyone can, can lend a hand to some some uh, podcasters in need, then uh, they should do so. Mm -hmm, definitely, because we are all this here together, right? It's, as a community of people who are interested in these topics and also, I guess, as, as podcasters now, you know. So those, so those are the guys who who paved the way for us. Yeah. Maybe we should, it's time for pay it forward. And it's tough too, because they have, uh, the commercials and all that, and, and we don't need to do that. So it's almost mm -hmm. more challenging for traditional radio talk shows and traditional internet radio talk shows who have to have like 10 minutes of commercials every 30 or yeah. 40 minutes. Yeah. Let's be honest here. I, I hate <laughs> the commercials they run on their sh on their show you know they're they're not only bothersome they are you know uh, i don't know pathetic you know the kind of things they, they that the network tries to advertise during the program but at the same time no you, you one keeps has to remind that this is this is a, a, a something that you get to enjoy for free right you know you get to either subscribe on iTunes or you or listen it live when when it is broadcast I think every every Sunday so I mean it's it's a small price uh, a price to pay you know in order to 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 learn a lot you know to listen to all the, the guests they have you know listen to the comments that Gene and Chris uh, uh, provide during the discussion uh, I think you know the the golden star and a paranormal radio deserves deserves to be preserved and deserves to be held. So, what else have you got uh, that you're looking into right now besides appearing on all these other shows? <laughs> How about yeah, uh, well, red pills? Do you have any new red pills coming up? Yeah, I think that right now two of the most important stories there are 
uh, being discussed by the Portion community this week were actually two that were mentioned by, by our friends, uh, Ben and Aaron and Mysterious Universe. The first one was about a very cryptic uh, article that uh, was printed on this uh, military magazine, Soldier of Fortune, that had the title uh, Mothman Mystery Solved, I think, was the, the, the title. And apparently, I don't even know who, who wrote this article, but uh, apparently it was the idea that all the weird happenings that occurred on this small town of, of Point Pleasant, Virginia in 1967, which were uh, described by John Keel in the you know, famous book, The Mothman Prophecies, were the result of uh, some military tests with uh, paratroopers, you know, green berets that were going to be then sent to Vietnam, and they were testing this new type of uh, uh, parachute, I think it's called a uh, halo. So they were apparently doing these jumps in the night, and, and the uh, paratroopers, you know, the guys doing the jumps, they were using some kind of... Uh, glowing paint so the idea is that well to make this story the long story short uh, according to this article all the mothman sightings you know the, the people describing this weird you know eight foot tall uh, or seven foot tall you know uh, being with kind of like bat like wings and glowing red eyes they were nothing but uh, soldiers, green, green beret soldiers, trying at these new parachutes. Huh? Yeah. So I knew it. I fucking knew it. And the fucking <laughs> yeah. the fucking red was the laser from their fucking laser sights. The red eyes. No, it can that can be man because the witnesses reported that the eyes were too uh, too separated. You know, they were not as close. Uh, He's got a fucking gun under each arm. <laughs> okay, that's it. So yeah. uh, the, Next. the mysterious universe guys do a pretty good job of wrapping that up. It's it's pretty cool. I was thinking, uh, and I don't think they mentioned this, but I kind of skipped through it pretty fast. What wow. if what if the Mothman was a true mystery and there was a humanoid sightings, and then they decided to not only send the military, yeah, not only as a as a test because maybe they were gonna test some of these. Green Beret, you know, parachute technologies and all that, but also to to do an investigation at the same time. And then they can also use it as a cover story and say, well, just like the uh, the flares and, you know, in uh, the Phoenix Lights or whatever, where they can just say, oh, it's, well, we did an exercise with these Green Berets and it's all documented here and this is why. But really it's to follow the real Mothman around. I don't know about documented because as far as I'm concerned, this little article didn't mention any kind of uh, you know, uh, official reports or documentation. Well, there's really nothing, uh, nothing to support this kind of odd explanation. Yeah, right. Yet. And also, well, yeah, yet, but also one he comes to think, why now, you know? Why, why come up with this now? Interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I mean, uh, I think that it only adds more mystery to this already mysterious case instead of trying to, you know, clear clear things up. Hmm. Green beret training exercises. Yeah, yeah. maybe may, maybe there's some green ber uh, veteran green beret that is a fan of the Grand America show. Maybe if you can contact us, you know, either by... Tell us that you did Mothman fucking <laughs> exercises in Point Pleasant. Yeah, yeah tell Moth us that you were in with cold, man. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that there's a whole squadron of injured colds. <laughs> so what was the other uh, story that uh, you find is important right now? Well, you think that was weird and crazy. The other one was even crazier is this uh, story run by this Iranian news agency telling how Edward Snowden 
the, the documents that he leaked reveal how the United States government is run now by uh, tall white extraterrestrials, the same type of group that uh, used to support the Nazis during World War II, uh, the Second. And now... Uh, tall white evil yeah. extraterrestrials, right? Apparently, well, they're, they're, they're tall they're, and they're white, they're evil, you know, if you are, if you happen to be in the Middle East, apparently. And they're white so supremacists? I don't know, man, but it's... Because they it were in so, a Nazi case. Well, subtly. They've and they're learned, white. They've learned from their mistakes because they lost that one. So now they're a little more politically correct. I don't know, man. Maybe maybe Aaron is right. You know, I don't know, I don't know if you happen to listen to the last Mysterious Universe episodes. And I'm, I'm, uh, Aaron was joking to say, well, maybe the aliens uh, were deliberately causing the Nazis to lose the war. You know, I don't say uh, that sounds kind of uh, crazy, but that's something that I too have considered and even wrote something about it uh, on one of the blog, one of the blog posts I uh, uh, linked to in the Intrepid, Intrepid magazine today, blog, the one that I titled up. White elephants and silver saucers. You know the idea that maybe you know the the, the Nazis did get, did the the aliens did give some type of weird tech to the Nazis, and the Nazis got so obsessed with the with the, the technology that instead of trying to really focus their their resources, you know, on trying to actually win the war, they just lost waste their time with the goddamn alien saucers. And well, there you go. Uh, I'm not really saying here that I actually believe that's what happened, because, but it, it was something of an interesting uh, mental experiment, if you will. What do you think of that one, Darren? I really wasn't expecting you to say that after Edward Snowden. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say that. Well, you know what, the thing is that not the, reptilians. So maybe this shit is true. The British are fucking reptilians. The states are fucking tall whites. And what uh, are, what's running the uh, what's running the uh, the Middle East then? Who knows? But I remember that during the days of John Keel, uh, the now man. that we were discussing the Mothman, you know that the many black that he described, they were. Kind of like uh, five foot, foot six uh, men with uh, olive skin and black black hair. Kind of look like I don't know uh, Italians or people from the Mediterranean. Hmm. They, you don't you don't you don't get to hear much about uh, those kind of UFOs nowadays. Do you guys ever wonder if the military industrial complex is actually building? their infrastructure for an alien invasion like you know how you hear about um Werner von braun was it him that said that that said that after i think it's more terrorism... fucking plausible that they're building uh forces for an alien invasion what Werner von braun said was that uh, the, the alien threat was going to be an excuse in order to keep uh, uh, maintaining a military spending but he was at, at least the the people mentioning that uh, that uh, that kind of uh, allegation they were alluding to this so-called uh, blue beam project you know of trying to 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 construct an, an illusionary uh, alien invasion in order to keep the, uh, the people in the world you know scared of the of the aliens so they will gladly uh, uh, forfeit all their freedoms, you know, and, and accept the new world government. So the what idea it, is that it's, it's something of a, what people in the conspiracy theory will call a false flag attack. Yeah, or, or even, yeah. So, but what if, what if you flip that around and go even deeper and say that, that the building up of America as a superpower is just mm -hmm. a, a farce in a way that, so, so creating all these conflicts on Earth to build America up as a superpower is actually building up this 
army and this infrastructure because there is a real threat that's going to happen. Okay, so they're building the army, they're building the infrastructure. The aliens Take are the building... elites and get the fuck off no, this Yeah, planet. no, to actually defend us from like a, you know, Ender's Game type scenario. I oh. think we're going to be the invaders. Like, you know, and then so... So the alien invasion, like since since the forties, and they like this is the big secret, and one of the reasons why they won't let disclosure happen is because the truth is so fucking ugly that people really won't be able to handle it, and that what they're doing is building up as much of a, you know a military industrial complex as they can to maybe give us a chance. Okay, but also you need to remember what Grant Cameron said on the sh on this show that maybe. Uh, someone is trying to, to 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 promote all those very scary uh, 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 ideas and speculations, so that when the truth finally comes out and say, "Oh well, you know what? Uh, the aliens are not really here to kill us or to eat us or you know to drink our blood. They they just they're just here." And people will say, "Oh, is that it? Is that all?" Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, okay, that's good. You know, I mean. <laughs> Let's yeah, go yeah. about our yeah. business. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not saying I believe in that theory. I'm just wondering if if you guys have ever thought about that. Sometimes I wonder. Yeah, because it, it seems like the military industrial complex is so out of control, and it's so, it's just, it's just unstoppable and unsustainable and unsustainable. Like how you know, it just seems sort of weird to me. It seems like there's got to be some other reason why we need this type of military presence on the planet. Like, it just doesn't make sense to me. So, I just started well, thinking. Like, hmm. I actually off, think man. that, yeah, I mean, people give, give a lot of uh, crap to someone like Stan Friedman for still defending the MJ-12 papers and all that, but there's no denying that Stan is right on the money when he says that Tribal warfare is still the main occupation of uh, of our species. You know, I mean, we we fight for very uh, uh, small-minded problems. You know, I mean, it's not for small patches resources. of land or for small resources. You know, or even for petty ideologies. You know, so hmm, I don't know what's my point here, but. The thing is that the, the, the military industrial complex, the way I see it right now is because America feels that it, it, they still need to be the police of the world. You know, they still need to go and put out the fires everywhere they, they, they're needed. You know, I don't know if you guys, have you guys uh, listened to um, this interview that uh, John Stewart on The Daily Show had with Robert Gates, the former uh, Secretary of Defense? No. No. It's it's interesting, you know. I mean, the guy, it's he was kind of blaming this uh, very insane bipartisanship that is going on here right now in, in in the American Congress for many of the problems they have with uh, both the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and and also all the problems they have with. The, the, the terrible situation of, tr of treating all the veterans of war, you know, the guys who who go to these wars, get injured, and then, you know, they can't get any disabilities or, every, um, or any treatment for, for, for their injuries. And or, or PTSD, yeah. So, well, yeah, exactly, you know, either either mental or physical injuries, right? And, yeah, yeah. And, and, and it was interesting, but you clearly could see that the guy is still a firm believer that America needs to be uh, on uh, on top of, uh, of of the pyramid. You know, it, it 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 still needs to be this great superpower in control of uh, everything. Huh. That only started fucking sixty years ago. Yeah. Well. Well, or when the Federal Reserve was made. Well, no, well, the mil the military thing was more like after, like before World War Two. America didn't really go fucking poking its nose in too much shit. No, not well, not really. There was World War One, and and it's interesting, you know, and right to think about that. This year, it's going to be one hundred years after the the Great War. You know, the war that people thought it's going was going to end all wars. And yeah. I read 
some article the other day in the net, some historian that was uh, warning us that we were that the humanity was making the same kind of mistakes that eventually led to the Great War. Huh. It ends. It ended all wars. It ended all wars that could be ended. Now it's just wars that don't have an ending. No, ah, World War II came like twenty years. Yeah. Twenty years later. Well, actually, yeah, World, also, World War Two, I guess, had an ending, but other than that, well, kind of. Not if you think about it, because if you think about it, World War Two uh, led to the separation of the two Koreans, right? <laughs> yeah. And the and the and, and the Korean War, and well, they still are fighting over that. In that part of the world, you know, you they still have crazy motherfuckers like Kim Jong Un, you know, threatening to 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 blast us all to the Stone Age, along with killing all his his next of kin, <laughs> <laughs> and and Dennis Rodman singing Happy Birthday to him. So in a way, the aftermaths of World War Two are not over. Yeah, plus the whole Israel thing. There's that too, definitely. You know, Ariel Sharon, who passed away last week, I guess, and some people are mourning him, and some people are uh, are very glad that he finally kicked the buckets. But they're still having that problem, and I really don't know what's going to be the solution to that. So, yeah. Enjoy it while you can, boys. <laughs> so hey Darren, you've yeah. been in, in contact with an artist who's uh who's gonna be doing some art for Grand America, eh? Barry Hoon? Yeah, I have, yeah, Barry Hoon. Yeah, did John you get the Hoon. link I sent you there, Red Pill Junkie? The the link to the um uh, the Skype. Hoonology. Right now? Yeah, I sent right it now? to your Skype chat. Yeah. I'll check out oh, this guy's uh right. Yes. I was wondering what what the fuck is that <laughs> on, my, on my computer? Okay, I'm opening it right now. He's gonna uh, he's gonna do one of these for us, and it's uh, www.hunology, h-o-o-n-o-l-o-g-y dot co dot uk, and he does these oh, pictures nice. for he does like 20 minutes a day, I think, or 15 minutes a day, and uh, there's a whole uh, I think there's like a there's a whole little process to it that's I think is pretty neat. So he's gonna get in touch with us. In the next few days here, in the next week or so, I think, and we're gonna, he's gonna do one while he listens to the Grimerica show and send it to us. So, and, um, and is this kind of like, is this kind of like, um, those magic eye posters from the late 80s and early 90s and, and just do done in stages so you can actually see the creation of it? I'm not sure. I'm not a hundred percent sure. Like, it's just, I think it's supposed, supposed, to, yeah, maybe it is. Because I think what he does is he, he starts out with a a form like a tree or something like that, and this this beautiful tree uh -huh. which is symbolizing a bunch of things, and then he he wraps it in like stages later on, and it basically hides it unless you. But it's can... like a spiritual thing too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's pretty cool. I'm looking forward to uh, tree, checking it out. The tree is each of us and all of us. And by offering us this mirror, Barry guides us in looking deeply into ourselves, our potentials, opportunities, and challenges. He both tells us what he sees and shows us how to see for ourselves in this rich mythic tapestry of life he has drawn. So that'll very be cool. Soon. Yeah, very cool. I mean, I, I, it seems as if he is letting his... Uh subconscious take over on the creative process which is yeah. something that every true artist should dare to do yeah 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 so i can't wait we'll make sure and link to that in the show notes and we'll uh we'll keep you guys updated with how that goes and i'm really looking forward to it so uh awesome. thanks a lot awesome. barry mm -hmm. yeah i also wanted to mention our uh mention our amazon portal too eh uh guys that um if anybody wants to buy items from amazon especially big items like what can you buy there like cars or elephants or something that costs a lot <laughs> yes. um go through grimerica.ca and uh, click on amazon 
and we get a tiny, tiny portion of that, and it doesn't cost you anything more. Somehow, this big corporation, Amazon, doesn't mind giving us a slice to send you their way. Uh, Bolelli's co-host there, is it Rick or Richard? or He was saying Richard the other day he was calling it corporate blood money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty, yeah, sometimes I wonder about it, but yeah, we're going to have yeah, Daniele Bolelli some, on. Maybe, maybe there's some secret catch, like someday the Amazon Corporation will contact you and say, okay, so now on, you have to uh, keep one of our drones in your home. <laughs> Something like a, that. You got to let it, it was, charge on your roof. Yeah, it was in the, in the small print. Something. It was in the small print yeah. of your little uh, your portal contract. I agree. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Speaking one, of uh, Valeli, he's coming on uh, in just a couple days. We'll be doing the interview. That's going to be so awesome. I mean, it's a huge. Yeah, you're a big fan of his, eh? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I've just started listening in the last uh, month or so, and I've listened to a few now. And he's he's definitely got he's definitely got uh, an interesting take on things. He's a real neat guy. Mm -hmm. Did you guys listen to the one that he recorded with his mother? No. no. Oh man, that's uh, when we stop this recording. You need to go and download that one immediately. That's an order because it's awesome, you know. I mean, if you think that Daniele is cool, you after you listen to his mother, you you'll realize, you know, just why he became so cool because he had a great role model in her. And apparently, the, the Christopher Ryan, oh, another one of our of our uh, favorite podcasters, is going to interview her. Nice. Oh wow, that'd be cool. Yeah, hmm. definitely. Yeah, well, I'm looking, uh, definitely looking forward to that. Uh, he's an interesting guy. That'll be, no, our next episode out is going to be Chris, Chris Weston will be next after, well, this episode, of course, is um, Susan B. Martinez, PhD, and she's talking about the little people amongst other things, right? We get into all kinds of stuff with her. Yeah, we get into all kinds of stuff. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting chat. You guys should enjoy it. And next week we'll be uh, chatting with Chris Weston. Yeah, Chris Weston was a partial creator uh, or mixer of the Orb, uh, some of the earlier Orb stuff. I don't know if you know those guys are Red Pill, but um, some of my favorite all-time albums are like mixed by this guy. So I really wanted to chat with him about uh, about that stuff, and he's into all kinds of conspiracies and stuff too. Or he was, anyways. That's an interesting talk. Yeah, that will be an interesting uh, episode, for sure. Yeah, and then uh, after that will be Bolelli, and then uh, I think it'll be John Ward and Scotty Roberts talking about Exodus after that, if everything goes according <laughs> to plan, which it usually doesn't. <laughs> Obviously. Always yeah. expect the... Oh, and the GMO man. guy. We're going to talk to the GMO guy. Yeah, we're, we're juggling a lot of potential guests right now, so it's it's kind of hard to actually line them all up. We have to find out how we're going to fit everybody in. So it's good. We got a good... Uh, I think we're going to have a good string going here in the beginning of 2014. Three shows a week. Yeah, and the audience should please keep in mind that if, they, if you want to keep this good streak going maybe you could consider also sending us our way you know some type of some small i don't know if donation is the kind of word you know contribution tip, contribution tip you know yeah even, a, even a review on itunes helps too ah uh, definitely you know yeah review us uh, wherever you can mm -hmm. on stitcher too right yeah stitch next year mm. we'll get uh what award. happened with that uh, uh, with that contest? You know, of, of, of... Uh, THC made it to the finals. Oh, we didn't make it to the finals. <laughs> Speaking of THC, I just listened to their interview with Stephen Greer. That was pretty good. That was really good, actually. Really? I, I liked it. Yeah. Did you guys Did you guys watch that uh, YouTube clip with Abby Martin on breaking the set? She no. had uh, Greer also on his show, which was kind of an improvement after seeing Paul Hellier's uh, appearance on RT. Yeah. But, well, that's not really saying much, is it? 
No. Well, there you have it, folks. Well, (laughs) there you have it. Yeah, I'll sum it up more podcast, too, for you. (laughs) And that's the way the cookie crumbles. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, well, thanks for... uh, Stay classy. Stay classy. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, thanks again for for joining us, uh, Red. And uh, we'll talk to you soon, for sure. Yeah, guys. Pleasure myself. And do you have anything else, uh, Darren? No, no. Thanks, Red. Thanks, Graham. Uh, I hope you guys mm-hmm. enjoy the chat here with Susan B. Martinez. Uh, it's an interesting one. And uh, we'll pick you up uh, after uh, the chat. America tonight we've got Susan B Martinez with us we're going to be talking about a few of her books uh, a little later on but first as always it's his Graham how's it going Graham hey Darren I'm doing pretty good buddy yeah it's good to be here in the new new uh, studio setup we got here first interview in the new studio yeah hopefully our sound will be a little bit better we'll uh, we'll see how do we sound Susan okay oh yeah yeah good okay I'm gonna just uh, Read your bio quickly here. So in, in uh, studio, in the Grimerica studio tonight, we've got Susan B. Martinez, PhD. And she's a writer, linguist, teacher, paranormal researcher, and recognized authority on the, oh, I meant to ask you to pronounce this one, the O-ship? O-ship? O-O-S-B-E. O-O-S-B-E Bible. With a oh, doctorate you were way in, off. <laughs> yeah, I was way off. With a doctorate in anthropology from Columbia University. And she's authored... Uh, Books like The Psychic Life of Abraham Lincoln, The Hidden Prophet. Uh, She's a book review editor for the Academy of Spirituality and Paranormal Studies. And her latest two books, The Lost History of the Little People and The Mysterious Origins of Hybrid Man, are probably what we'll be spending most of the time chatting about tonight. So uh, welcome to Grimerica, Susan. Thank you for inviting me. I guess we should should start with... um, a little bit about uh, your history and how you came to be interested in uh, some of these fascinating topics. Um, you know, Graham, um, when I when I really got into this uh, research and writing, I was uh, catching up with something I had started uh, more than forty years ago. I mean, you know, when I was a kid, I went on to graduate school and got my degree in anthropology and. Did that. It didn't stay very long in academics at all. I dropped out, and I've been on my own ever since. But uh, it kind of lay dormant for 40 years for me to go back to the origin of man and try to give a, a true picture of it as opposed to the standard model that's taught in academics. Yeah, that seems to be a... A theme uh, here in Grimerica, too, we've had some guests on talking about um, the forbidden archaeology type type genre of things. And it's uh, it seems to be coming out more and more. And now you're you're a part of this whole sort of I really disclosure. feel that, too. I really feel that it's uh, building up to the point where um, you're just uh, burying your head in the sand if you're following the... Uh, Extended uh, model. There's a new paradigm, and it's not on the horizon anymore. It's here. It's arrived. Uh, I've been studying uh, my, uh, the books by my colleagues, and uh, it, I mean, you know, stuff like uh, um, the uh, how long the uh, Americas have been inhabited. You know, there's a standard model, and now there's a new uh, version, which gives it much deeper time. Yeah, we just had uh, Fritz Zimmerman on 
And it was a lot about um, the, the opposite giant. of little people. Yeah, the giants in the Ohio Valley and that type of thing. So, Oh, yeah, I've heard of him. Uh, right. There are uh, two more books out on giants by my own uh, publisher this year. So that's really coming out. But, you know, uh, the little people have been neglected. But I, I, that was my job to write that book. Yeah, well, that's good. I mean, that's good. Some Somebody took the... The challenge on so since you're uh, jumping in little people there what what are the little people for people that don't know the well, little people they are, <laughs> they are the um suppressed race in in uh, among our ancestors uh the uh for, for example um you know the work of uh, discovering who our ancestors ancestors were uh uh, usually goes to the um, physical anthropologists. They're also called paleontologists. They study bones. Uh, they uh, study and create the fossil record. Uh, and, you know, there are standard uh, specimens in the fossil record. But uh, I noticed uh, while doing the research that uh, the... Uh, Paleontologists and diggers, you know, for bones, uh, very rarely mention the size of uh, these fossil men. Uh, and that goes for giants and it also goes for little people. So uh, I went back and uh, dug through the literature and found uh, this race of little people. They were originally called Ihins, that's spelled I H I N. They were also called the old ones. They were mythologized in places like Ireland to become the fairies and leprechauns and so on and so on. Hmm. So so is, is little people a, a politically correct term for Hobbit? Um, like, is that what we're talking about? Like, uh, Florensis, uh, is that, what is that, like Homo Florensis type thing? or? Uh, exactly. Uh, and that's when the uh, news really came out back in '04 when uh, the hobbits, so-called, were discovered on the island of uh, Flores in near Java. When was that, uh, sorry? Uh, that that pardon me. When when was when would that have been? When? Yeah. Back in uh, 2004. Oh, that's that recent. Yeah, it hit the news in 2004, and it was in all the uh, journals, uh, and uh, uh, it was supposed to be so amazing um, that they were so little, they couldn't explain it. Uh, But I took that as my jumping-off point to explain how the little people figure in the fossil record. Hmm. So is this a global... uh sort of, I, I shouldn't say phenomenal, but it kind of is yes. like it's, it's, yes. yeah. it is, it is because, uh, little people are one of the, uh, earliest races. The only race on earth that was older than little people were the, uh, uh we can call them the ground people. Uh, they, and we're talking about the beginning We're really talking about the beginning here. Uh, The ground people were the first um, hominids. Are you familiar with the term? Hominid means a man-like. Yeah, Yeah, I'm not familiar Uh, with ground people, but we're familiar with hominids, so that's interesting. Yeah, ground people is a new uh, term. I'm introducing it from the uh, OASP. Um, But it's as good a term as any uh, in the... um, in academic language, it would be the Australopithecus of Africa and also the Artipithecus. But those are long terms, and they, they're not as catchy as uh, calling them a ground people. Or Asu is another name to the, for these people. Is that they ASU? Were, ASU. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They were uh, the first uh, man like creatures on earth, but they were not, they were kind of subhuman, you know, when you come right down to it, they, uh, they're like monkeys. 
Yeah, they lived in the trees. They scampered around sometimes on all fours. Uh, they did not have articulate uh, language, but they were men. And this is where the myth, uh, well, mythology comes in. There's a lot of world mythology that talks about these creatures, and I, I bring all of that into the book. Um, the race, the next race, the second race, on earth were the little people, the Ihens. And they were, in contrast to the ground people, they were of, of the modern type of uh, good symmetry uh, physiologically, uh, and they were spiritual. They were spiritual. They were called the sacred little people all around the world. Uh, were they technological? Uh, they they became uh, technological because, you see, um, one of the things I try to bring out in my writing is that uh, they uh, learned uh, technology and they learned science and they learned uh, agriculture and they learned metallurgy from their spirit familiars. From, they were constantly in communion with the spirit world. And so the angels could uh, work with them, and the whole purpose of the I Hen race was to uh, uplift the mankind and get Asu down from the trees, get him educated, and uh, more like a human being. So, what? When? Are, how long ago are we talking about here? Do you think? Um, I. That's another thing I I don't I challenge against the standard model. I don't use the uh, chronology and the deep time that uh, physical anthropology uses. Uh, they will tell you that, uh, that uh, Asu man goes back five million years. I will tell you that none of this began until 80,000 years ago. So there's a dramatic a conflict of time. You know, there's also a dramatic conflict of time when you compare uh, the scientific version with the biblical version. The biblical version says man has been here on earth no more than 10,000 years or so. So uh, the figure I come up with is kind of between the two between the biblical and the scientific, 80,000 years ago was when uh, the temperature of the earth uh, came down uh, low enough for man to live and survive here on the planet. So they did they evolve from the ground people, or were they a separate race, do you think? Um, they were separate. Because we've talked about... Uh, theories in in dry america before about like um early man eating mushrooms and kind of like like psychedelics uh, actually being like some of the cause for our expanded consciousness way back when so i wonder if uh the little people didn't need to eat mushrooms uh they were constitutionally um uh set up that way uh they they had the spirit part they 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 introduced the spirit part to humanity. That's why we are what we are. That's why we're not still in the trees. And that's where all the fairy myths and, and so what are some of the more, more popular myths that these little people are sort of responsible for? Well, you have the, uh, like the uh, leprechaun. dwarf kingdom all over Europe and you have all, all over uh, the Americas particularly North America, uh, North American, Native Americans have tons of stories about the magical little people, um, the uh, scary little people. They're all versions, uh, shapes and sizes of them. Uh, but while I was working on the book, I realized you could write a separate book just on the Native American uh, legends of the little people. They, it, so they coexisted it, with, with modern humans? Yeah. Uh, with modern humans? Well, yeah, with, with well, yeah, I guess like, like what within, do you mean within by the last, like last, last 10,000 10, years. Let's, 
let's um, let's hear that question again so I can answer it right. Okay, so if we consider modern humans, everything within the last 10,000 years is what I would call modern human. Um, have the little people interacted with with us, I suppose, in the last 10,000 years? Are they, are they still around or they've died off? Like, well, when did um, they disappear? Yeah, okay. Uh, well, that's a couple of questions and I'll try to uh, remember them. Uh, they went extinct as a race uh, about... Um, well, in, in some parts of the world, 20,000 years ago, in other parts, uh, 10,000 years ago, and in other parts, uh, only uh, about four or 5,000 years ago. But that was the last of the pure uh, Ihens. However, they did interbreed with uh, the other races on Earth. So uh, their uh, descendants are still here on Earth. Uh, they're, I, I believe I devoted a chapter to... Uh, yeah, chapter two, uh, to where they are today. And mostly they're in uh, uh, remote uh, areas, but they are all over the world. If you've, if you've t- taken a look at the book, you will see that. So there are some around still, but, but the main population was extinct anywhere from 5,000 years ago back. Yeah, yeah. Um, Here's another news story that uh, came out. It, it's like, you know, uh, it, it's happening now. It's, the truth is coming out. Um, this was only about mm, uh, five years ago or less. A news story came out about a uh, village in, um, in the uh, mountains of Ecuador. Uh, it may be Loja province, I'm not sure. Uh, there is a, a, a wonderful video online. <laughs> it's so great. Uh, you would have to Google uh, Laron uh, syndrome. Laron, uh, L-A-R-O-N syndrome is a, a, a scientific name for um, uh, uh, pygmy-sized people. And uh, they have like been midgets found... Or like midgets? Pardon? Like like little people, like midgets. Yeah, but uh, not um, but well proportioned. Um, okay, uh, Laron syndrome. The uh, it was named after an Israeli scientist uh, who identified uh, this, and uh, they used his name. Uh, is there are populations with Laron in uh, Israel, Turkey, and the Bahamas. Uh, but now they found another group in Ecuador, uh, in, I think in 08. Um, and that, that's why I say if you Google the wrong syndrome Ecuador, you'll probably find it. Wonderful video. Um, they are white skinned. They are uh, very short of stature, let's say about a four, um, four feet tall, four and a half feet tall. Um, but the reason it uh, made the news was that they had discovered that these people do not get, get cancer or diabetes. So they suddenly got very interested in their DNA and who they were and where they came from. Uh, so that's uh, just another story of little people that cropped up uh, in the news. But they are in uh, many places. There are little people in New Guinea. There are little people in uh, hiding away in the uh, Philippines and uh, the, the one group in the Philippines uh, that is most like the original Ihens are called Abenlands and they're uh, a very uh, re- removed group. They don't interact with uh, the outside world. They're little, four and a half feet tall. They're uh, pale, pale skinned. The original Ihens were uh, white with white hair and yellow hair, and white skin or yellow skin. Yeah, I'm looking at a couple of pictures here. There's like whole families, and they're all just little. Huh. What picture is that? Uh, the, I think it's the Equ- Ecuadorian villagers may hold secret to longevity. Oh, are you looking online? Yep. Cool. 
So they are still still. So you would you would your argue your argument would be that these people are descendants of the same little people that used to um, rule the planet. Well, um, they were called the sacred little people. They were mostly a like a priestly class. Class. They were not. Uh, uh, they were not um, ruling the power, earth. Yeah, power yeah. and glory. They were ruling, yeah, I just mean, ruling like, the earth spiritually. Kind of like dominant species, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, they, were, they were dominant as opposed to like we'd be the dominant species now. Yeah, I don't think Darren meant like empirically ruling. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so, but, I, but I forgot the question. <laughs> no, that these, these um, like this family, for example, in Ecuador would be like direct descendants of that race that's been around since the ground people. Oh, absolutely. And uh, the, uh, the problem here is that the experts, and that's in quotes, um, are explaining uh, littleness as, uh, as some kind of a deficiency, a syndrome, um, the result of, uh, of a poor food supply, the result of... Uh, uh, <laughs> I have a whole list of them in the book. Uh, in other words, that they have uh, shrunk, shrunk, or shrunken. I don't know if I said that right, but they are shrunken. In other words, uh, uh, classically, the uh, uh, pygmies of the Congo are regarded as shrunken Africans, and uh, but it doesn't wash. They are not shrunken. They they are not uh, deficient. They just have the genes of their ancestors who were little people. Hmm. So uh, can we go back for a minute to, is there, how did you come up with 80,000 years? Is there like, is there any, do we have any direct evidence? Like, is there texts or, or like, how did, how do we know? Well, you know, I write on other uh, subjects, uh, including um, global cooling. <laughs> I've been writing about global cooling for many years. Uh, and so I'm um, looking at the temperatures in the tertiary uh, before mankind uh, came to exist on the earth. And it was too hot. You see, this, again, I'm going against the flow here, but I, I believe the earth is very slowly cooling and drying. I've just uh, written about an article on a drought. Um, and so it is somewhere around that time, 80,000 years ago, that the uh, temperature, that the average temperature on Earth reached, uh, came down to 98 degrees. And that's the temperature uh, mankind needs to, um, to exist and reproduce. Huh. Yeah, you can talk about global cooling here in Dry America. We, we have uh, no problem with that at all. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. In fact, you could you should actually forward us your article on uh, on that. We'd love to read that. Oh, oh, good. We haven't really bought into the whole global global warming thing, right. you know. Listen, let me tell you. Let me skip a couple of books ahead. Um, the Little People book was followed by the Hybrid Man book, which came out in November. Uh, but my next book is called Out of the Box. And it'll be out in uh, uh, late this year. Oh, it's 2014. Yeah, 2014, yeah. yeah. Oh, I have to get used to that. Anyway, it'll be out probably in November or December. Um, chapter four in that book is um, about uh, global, the myth, the awful myth of global warming. So I finally had a chance to devote an entire chapter uh, to the subject. And uh, so that'll be, that'll be next year, and I'd be happy to come back and talk about it. Yeah, I look forward to that. So what do you, so, okay, we've been talking about this here a little bit about the, 
this global cooling or like this mini ice age that they were actually talking about in the 60s and 70s. And then all of a sudden it switched to global warming and now they're calling it, or, you know, they, what, whoever is calling it climate change. So do you, just to get off top of topic a little bit, um, do you think yeah. that, that man has an impact on climate? Like is climate changing because of us? No, I don't think uh, the answer is no. That's what I think too. Uh, yeah, yeah, the answer is no. And uh, there's a, a lot of politics involved here, and there's a, a, a very a dangerous situation for the third world people. Not to uh, say there's that. Going to be, no. There's going to be famine, and there's going to be a lot of very bad results of what they're doing. That's not to say uh, that. Like, I'm not, I can't agree that us totally fucking up the planet is a good idea either, but I just don't think that the, that... I don't think we're as important or pivotal as we think we are. Um, I go back to the um, the, uh, making of worlds, the beginning, uh, how planets begin. Uh, And, you know, it's it's very hard to find agreement in the uh, scientific world. I mean, a hundred years ago, there's there's a lot of things that we, we, we we had right. A hundred years ago that, you know, just got messed up by uh, modern 20th century science. A hundred years ago, most men and women of science uh, believed correctly, I I think, uh, that uh, planets begin as a fiery uh, mass of gas and eventually solidify and eventually cool down. And that process is continual. The cooling is continual until uh, planetary death, which is the extinction of a planetary world, which is cold and dry like Mars. So that it it doesn't even fluctuate during that cooling period, you mean? Like it, it goes from that hot, fiery mass of gas all the way to a Mars-like planet. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it must... that's the long-term yeah, yeah. Uh, picture. In the short term, yes, there are all fluctuations. We know all about the PDO and, and the El Nino, and all of those fluctuations uh, have to be taken into account, but uh, they don't give the long-term picture. The long-term picture is cooling and drying. And so you think that's going to get worse now and, and that there's going to be more problems in the world, especially the third world now? Can you expand on that a little bit? Um, you can say whatever you want here. Yeah, cap and trade is uh, something to uh, consider. Um, the uh, policies the governments are setting up that uh, ultimately hurt the uh, farmer and these are always peasant people uh, we're talking about. Um, let's talk about uh, global warming next time because I, I, I got my mind on um, <laughs> the uh, evolution book. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's uh, let's get back to that. Yeah, that's no problem. So, okay, let's get back to that then. So, what um, we were <laughs> we just did this show on giants, and now we're talking about little people. So it makes me think, of course, that at, at some point in our past, whether that was like ten to 20,000 years ago, it was more like Lord of the Rings than ever. It was like giants and little people and different animals and humans kind of evolving through the fertile crescent. Um, <laughs> well, um, the sequel to the Little People book, the Hubbard Man book, um, says that we did not evolve. It's an anti-evolution book. Um, So what I'm saying is that rather than evolving over the thousands of years, these races just crossbred. And that's why you get so many different types. These types, the paleontologist takes as uh, evolving, transitional, intermediate types in evolution. But... According to my analysis, they just interbred. It's called, I've got an archaeology friend who calls it the nookie factor. And he, he also builds it as 
sex in a single species. And, and that's the model that I'm introducing here. I don't think we need evolution, Darwinian evolution at all. So it's just like monkeys banging little people and giants are getting in there and human beings are just what yeah, came out the, out the ass end. I didn't quite get that. That's fine. It's probably better. So is <laughs> do we have any evidence for for the the little people on the in the fossil record? Do we see much? Like do you think does the Smithsonian have a warehouse full of little people skeletons right next to all the giants <laughs> they have? Yeah. Um funny you should mention the Smithsonian because um the, some of my colleagues are have been um, zeroing in on that, uh, the problem of disappearing specimens, specimens disappearing in museums. Um, one of the book on giants, um, I think it, it's got a title, something like uh, the, the Giants Who Ruled America, that came out, uh, that's coming out this year, uh, 2014, by Richard Dewhurst. Uh, I reviewed the book, so I'm familiar with it. It's from my own publisher. Um, it he takes issue with the what the Smithsonian has done to cover up uh, the existence of certain fossils, fossils which would challenge, if not uh, do away with the current model. Why would the mainstream or the Smithsonian, um, I can see why they would cover up giant's bones in a way because there's not a bunch of giants, you know, walking around us right now. But we have, you know, we have little people in our culture now. So I wonder why the mainstream wants to just sort of not really accept the, uh, the you know what I mean? Like the, the, the paradigm of little people being around for so long and, and little people sort of pervading our culture more than, than they did? Um, it's a very intricate uh, subject, why things have been suppressed. Uh, and there are different uh, aspects to it. Um, to Sometimes it's a matter of science versus religion. In certain cases, it comes down to that. And we can track that down. In in other cases, I would say that that it's just a matter of uh, uh, stubbornness, the fixed idea uh, that, and if anything comes along to challenge it, it it's got to be. Uh, listen to this. Uh, I got an email from a fellow in England recently who had read my book on hybrid man. And you know that book uh, discounts Darwinism completely. It just accounts for the races according to crossbred types, hybrid. Yeah. No evolution. Anyway, um, he told me about someone. I'm not going to mention specific details, okay? I'll just... Uh, I'll just mention it in, in, in general. Yeah. Uh, a gentleman who's very uh, established in the um, recording and um, 
presentation of uh, fossil fossil bones and the fossil record in one of the most important places where they do that in England, um, decided to uh, check certain things. Well, to make a long story short, he he found that uh, the the fossils that really were important were uh, hidden away, and the ones that were put on display were uh, just mocked up to prove the theory. Uh, and um, he didn't find uh, the evidence for the Cambrian explosion, for example, that that goes back 500,000, uh, uh, no, 500 uh, million years uh, to uh, um, one of the earliest periods when um, animal life came into existence. He didn't. He didn't find uh, the, the data accords with the theory at all, as far as that. Anyway, make a long story short, um, he sent a memo to the heads of uh, all the departments concerning this lack of evidence and uh, suppression of uh, evidence. Uh, and, the, and my friend in England told me that uh, the next thing that happened was he was uh, hit by a car outside the museum and killed. Jeez. Playing for keeps. Wow. So, um, do you, so it seems like intentional because, you know, I was going to say it could be that, uh, they just want to maintain the current paradigm or, or it's people within their, within their own institutions or whatever that are just going, you know, you know why? Cause it's actually the little people's planet and we're invading. <laughs> and, and, but, you know, uh, none of us know really what happened there. I don't know. You don't know. But um, this uh, gentleman who had worked with him uh, at the museum there uh, in, in London, uh, I I wrote back to him. I emailed back to him. I, I was I wanted more details about the uh, incident. And uh, guess what? He never answered me. He it, he he didn't want to go into it because it's a very touchy whether it really was an accident or something beyond that. Yeah, it's hard to when death and and that type of thing is concerned. It's hard to to go straight to that conspiracy angle. But it's. Uh... But you look at any of the authors who are doing the kind of work that I'm doing, uh, Frank. Joseph, Robert Schock, Philip Coppins, uh, uh, they're all devoting many pages of their books to the suppression of material. So it's getting to that uh, point. It's, it's getting to, I don't know, uh, a, a, tip, a tipping point. point. Yeah. yeah. So, would, so have you noticed it changing over the last five or 10 years or, or when did you see, have you seen it shift at a certain point or is it, or is it just shifting now? Shifting what? The, the attitude? yeah, like the, this kind of suppression being like, it seems like it's coming out a little bit more. Yeah. Be, because it's a barrier to knowledge and we have arrived at the age of uh, truth. We're in the new new age, and this is going to be the age of truth as opposed to the age of half-truth. We've been fed half-truth up till now, and we, we want the truth. Yeah, and I think with the Internet and, and the information age we're in, it's like truth is just seeping through the cracks, and it's it's finding its way to everyone in a way. And, and the, it seems to me like the... We're seeing through the veil. People are starting to uh, see through the veil, and it seems like everything is kind of collapsing. You know, bottom line is, if you have built your career on a certain uh, set of data and theories, you cannot turn around and uh, say, well, I was wrong. I was wrong. Well, actually, you can, but that takes courage, and very few people have that kind of courage. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So can you tell us more about your, your latest book then, the Hybrid Man book? Well, uh, you've got a good introduction already that it's all about uh, the racism men, how they uh, interbred, how uh, 
there was no evolution taking place. We we don't we haven't changed. We haven't changed physiologically. Uh, there is we don't mutate. Uh, natural selection is only a minor uh, factor uh, in, in the anatomy of man. Uh, all, all that you can, all that I can see, and demonstrate in the book is that one race mixed with another race, and a, a new type of race came about. So, is it different so where with did animals? Where the first race come from? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Like, well, because Darwin's theory of evolution says that we started as like whatever bacteria or whatever in the water, and we slowly became multicellular organisms, yeah. and then we turned into fish, and then we crawled on the land, and then we became this, then we became that, and now we are where we are. So, right. so if you're saying there's no evolution at all, then it was where does the for meant for humans? Oh, for humans. So, so everything else evolved, but humans are just a result of. So Darwin's theory of evolution is right, right up until humans. I just want to make sure okay. I'm I'm getting this correct. Say that, say that again, so I, I so, understand. So, like, do you are you throwing out Darwin's theory of evolution completely, or you're just saying yes. that humans aren't a result of it? Um, well, yes, I am throwing it out uh, completely, but my argument is really only about man. It's not about uh, animal, animals and bacteria because I'm not a biologist, but I do have my training in uh, anthropology. Um, and I think that the only real alternative uh, to evolution when you're talking about all uh, life uh, is creationism, and I am a creationist. So you believe, I believe that... I believe in the creator. So you believe that someone just created all the races like giants and little no, people? No, no, no. They, those races uh, uh, came about um, mostly through uh, interbreeding, as I mentioned. Uh, and I think that the period of giantism, which um, I've been trying to uh, pin it down, I think the period of giantism was possibly around 40,000 years ago. And I think that, uh, I think that if you're looking for the cause of it, I think it was something cosmological with the kind of uh, with, it, now we have to go into cosmology because the Earth. Uh, this is this is how I see it: uh, the Earth and the entire solar system is traveling through space. Uh, at each point in time, it's in a different part of space, and the the different regions of the cosmos have uh, different qualities, densities, and different great kind of radiation and so forth. I think that uh, ultimately it will be found that uh, giantism in, in plant life as well as animal life uh, came about uh, at a time when the earth was passing through a, a, a radiated part of the universe. Wow, that's interesting. Huh. And which could also explain other types of... Uh phenomena giant planet, sloths or shit. like the dinosaurs or something like that that actually is pretty, that's for that's it that's huh so do you, right. so were the daughters were, were, no were, were the sons of god mating with the daughters of men then to create some of these giants like is that um, part of like the whole nephilim thing and all that yeah um uh, i study that a lot because um, that's something that people are familiar with so i'm trying to um hook it into the actual facts that what actually happened on this earth. Um, every mythology, I mean, not every mythology, but all around the world, uh, there are uh, legends of sky people. So in a certain sense, we can correlate that with the sons of God, you know, the, with beings uh, uh, not of this earth. Yeah, yeah. The, da the daughters of men would just represent uh, earth, earthlings. Yeah. Um, uh, 
at this point, we might get into where the Ihens came from, where the little people came from. So maybe I should. Uh, yeah, that sounds good. That. I can't wait. Yeah, because that will tie tie it uh, together. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about ETs and and ancient uh, astronauts and all that kind of thing. That's the stage we're up to in exploring this subject. But here's what I think is really uh, behind it. I don't think that uh, ETs or ancient astronauts ever landed on our planet. Uh, I think that's an interpretation. And I think that the basic uh, history is the following. Uh, back then, around uh, 80,000 years ago, not 80,000, but 75,000 years ago, when the gods and goddesses looked down upon the earth and saw uh, the ground people not progressing, uh, the, they, uh, the creator actually uh, formulated a plan to bring uh, a kind of higher intelligence to the earth to uplift that Asu man and, and make him human. Um, the creator called out to the universe for volunteers to come to the earth. This, this part of the story I get from the Oaspe uh, Bible, but there are similar uh, uh, legends in the, um, the Hebrew Shekinah and other stuff. Anyway, uh, called out for volunteers to come to the earth to uplift uh, the uh, animal man to human status and uh, the volunteers came and they were those who volunteered were uh, spirits who had died in, in infancy on other worlds uh, they had never uh, experienced a corporeal life uh, so they they came as a spirit to to the earth but they uh, took on corporeal body. It was the age of Simu, uh, something else you can uh, learn about in Oaspe. And but but the you know the paleontologists also recognize it. Uh, uh, Stephen uh, Jay Gould called it uh, um, a f the form of pla plas a time of plasticity uh, for uh, human for, uh, for uh, living forms. Uh, there was an earlier time when, uh, uh, which was a formative time. In any case, uh, the volunteers came as spirits but took on corporeal bodies because it was the time of SEMO. It was possible in that time. It's no longer possible. The earth keeps changing its character. Uh, they took on corporeal bodies and uh, they they came as teachers uh, to uplift Asu Man, but um, they were told to not do one thing. What What do you guess that was? Uh, to uh, kill each other? <laughs> That's good. Interbreed. Uh, right. Right. Uh, they weren't supposed to, but they were tempted and they mixed with the ground people and they produced the race that uh, paleontologists call Homo erectus. Uh, no, 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 I didn't say that right. Yeah, yeah no, the, that's uh, a little people, right? Australopithecus, it says, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, okay, uh, the um, volunteers, uh, let me correct myself, I didn't say it right. That's okay. Volunteers um, interbred with the uh, ground people and produce the little people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then in turn, the little people uh, intermingled with uh, the uh, Asu man, and, and that's what produced the Homo uh, erectus. Okay. <clears throat> so in a way, it's, it's, it's E.T., Right, in a way, we we are evolved from space beings, kind of, or or God, if if you want to, or gods, if you want to say it like that. 
you know, the whole thing, when you boil it down, the whole thing depends on your understanding of the spirit world and the possibilities that are there and the uh, uh, direction that we are given by the angel world. And if you don't uh, believe in that or are not willing to think about that, then all you've got is uh, Darwin, Darwinian evolution. Yeah. Yeah. So, you, you, okay, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just going to expand on, because you're talking about ancient aliens and, and the ancient astronaut theory and all that. So, you know, way back then, uh, when sort of the little people came about from the ground people, I mean, ever since then, we've had lots of, you know, UFO sightings and all kinds of crazy stories of alien encounters and all that. So do you, do you not think that that's um, evidence of continual visitation from ETs? Um, as, as, as long as you brought it up, let me tell you what my opinion is on, on uh, UFOs and ETs and astronauts. Okay. Well, no, let's put it in the modern uh, context. Um, there's there's a, a very big literature on UFOs, and there's enough there to uh, let you know that something's going on. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, but I believe that it's uh, that all of these uh, sightings and these phenomena uh, can be a, a brought to one of two one of two possibilities. I think there are two possibilities. One is the uh, spirit world itself. Uh, and the angels, when you when you when you learn and you study about the spirit world and what powers the angels have, uh, they they can form uh, uh, fire ships. Uh, they can they can form anything out of the Assyrian uh, elements. And so, uh, some of those sightings are uh, Assyrian uh, starships. Okay, the second possibility. Uh, and I think reality uh, is a secret uh, government project. Uh, uh, all of the uh, advanced governments in the world today are doing uh, projects, experimenting with uh, uh, ships, you know, airships. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, there's that big to do about. Uh, uh, the cover up uh, in uh, New Mexico. Where is that at? Roswell. Yeah. Say that. That. Okay. They want us to think it's ETs. It's a. They want us to think it's a cover up of ETs. That they're covering up ETs. They're not covering up ETs. They're covering up their own uh, secret project. And even if it wasn't, if it was spirit world and angels it's probably easier for us to think it's ets like it, it'd be easier for humanity to grasp the et hypothesis than spirits and angels well it, maybe you know take your choice i don't agree with that I, no no yeah i think most of the world would be more gung-ho for spirits and angels wow yeah, maybe. I, how I, far I, you've gone into your little rabbit hole girl i'm i'm okay with all of the above for answers I agree. Well, let's just leave it at that. <laughs> so, so do you think that we're the only planet with with? Uh, no, no. That, so, how would your your sort of thinking go as far as other planets with intelligent life in in our galaxy or universe? Well, obviously, uh, I believe in Creator. I believe in uh, planet, uh, planets with uh, life uh, all over the universe. I mean, if, if I believe that the Creator could call out for volunteers and get uh, uh, spirits who had died in infancy oh, right, from right. other other worlds, right, 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 yeah. then then uh, I, I also believe that there are just uh, uh, unfathomable number of worlds. Uh, with life and with intelligence, um, that's not a problem for me. I think that people who think we're the only brain in the field are just not thinking straight. Yeah, I'd have to agree with that. 
Yeah, we we talk about all all these kinds of crazy things in in Grand America, so it's not a you know it's not a shock to us at all. Well, good. So, what else about your hybrid um, your hybrid man book? Can you uh, can you tell us? What do you want to know? <laughs> How it's gone so far since it's been out? Like since your first your release of the uh, the Little People book. And then this yeah. this hybrid man is it doing like is it uh, is it well accepted like you must it must be a bit of a challenge with uh, skeptics and the people that want to debunk uh, this. You know based something? On... I don't hear from the skeptics, and the experts are completely silent. I have even you know I've emailed a few uh, of them, you know the leading uh, people uh, in the field today, and uh, just asked for their. Um, mailing address so I could send them a copy of the book. Nothing, nothing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but um, but what what the uh, the good feedback I've been getting? Uh, some of it is from uh, radio people like yourself, and um, people have been telling me that they have thought this all their life, but they never saw the argument put together. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. That's very um, reassuring, I think, must be for you. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, good. So, do you think, uh, does that... Does that time frame, because you hear, we've talked to some other people who think that uh, dinosaurs and man might have actually coexisted in, in the past. Do you think, does your, does your theory that that puts the earth only cooling down enough for, for, for humans to exist some 80,000 years ago, does that mean that dinosaurs would have existed maybe 200 or, or a little somewhere in there? You know, um... I think uh, I've, I've written about the age of the Earth also. Um, our Earth, according to the experts, is 4.5 million years. Uh, um, bit, uh, billion. No, four, yeah. Billion, four, yeah. 4.5 billion, right? Yeah. Yeah, somewhere there, 4.5, yes. 4.7. Um, I think that's all wet, all wet. Uh, I think that's going to... Uh, be changing. That's just uh, uh, stands because the experts say it. Uh, uh, there's been some challenges to it. Um, and they put the dinosaur extinction at 65 million years ago. But, um, you know, um, there are, uh, take, take Brazil, for example. It's a huge country and it's got a lot of a jungle that nobody knows anything about, and you know the um, some of the proto historians have been showing us uh, pictures that ancient man drew of man coexisting with different kinds of saurians. They look like small dinosaurs, you know. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, if if they're still around in some form, not in the uh, huge uh, form. You know, the classic example is the colanth. It's a fish that supposedly went extinct uh, two million years ago. And meanwhile, in the, some uh, district in uh, Malaysia or south of Africa, I'm not sure where, they, they fish them regularly and they eat them. So... That was like a, that a blew a hole in uh, the extinction theory, uh, for one thing. So, you know, I take it with a grain of salt. I take the dates with a grain of salt, and I take the extinction theories with a grain of salt. Hmm. It reminds me of those stories of that dinosaur, um, what's that, like a brontosaurus, what's that, the big one, the brontosaurus kind? And Brachiosaurus. Yeah, like it's called, they call it Mokalium Bembo or whatever, and it's from, uh, I think it's from Africa or something, and the, the tribes people still like, 
describe seeing this creature that looks like an, a dinosaur. So yeah, you know, I I wouldn't doubt it, and I I think it's healthy to take all that stuff with a grain of salt because once you start learning about some of these discrepancies it really makes you wonder about all of uh the supposed you know factual fact, factual evidence we're living under right now so yeah. how how um, long how long how long is the lifespan of a planet like um, when does it how long from the pro when the process starts to when when it can no longer sustain life uh, um I was going to say that I've been um, toying with the figure of uh, for planet Earth uh, something like 30 million. That's a far cry from 4.5 billion. But uh, I've been putting together some evidence for the that they um, and uh, let's see. Uh, 30 million. So this planet might have another 20 million years to go, but it's different for the lifespan of mankind. Um, the, uh, uh, the model that I follow has mankind created um, 80,000 years ago. And Within the same model um, uh, is the assumption that we are now uh, past the halfway point of our existence on Earth, around the time of Moses, which was 3,500 years ago, was the halfway point uh, for uh, mankind. And the point we're at now in the New Age is, called, is considered the... Um, maturity point of mankind maturing completely and and then uh, within another uh, 75,000 years will be gone. Hmm. That's interesting. So Susan, we're gonna we're gonna have to uh, have you back on when you come out with your um, your climate change or global cooling book what what was the what was the name of that again um that book you know um, out, out of the box my, my yeah my title is out of the box but i had not written one book yet where the publisher hasn't changed the title oh really <laughs> maybe this will be the first <laughs> you could call it out of the out of the oven and into the the icy no. blue <laughs> i don't think so <laughs> Well, Susan, it's been a, a great chat. We'd like to really thank you for uh, for coming on the show, and um, yeah, we'll we'll keep in touch for sure, and talk to you about your out of the box book. That's great. Um, just stay in touch with Olatunji, and we we can make any arrangements. Yeah, for sure. And then, where can people find your stuff? We're going to link to your books and your um, your information in, in the show notes for our podcast. So, where can uh, do you have anything else that you want to leave the people? Uh, email websites anything like that um not really i reckon you could uh, find my books on uh, amazon or through my publisher inner traditions yeah that's great okay thanks a lot for for coming on the show tonight susan and, and you're welcome back in grime america anytime that's great and thanks for having me
Hey, well, that was our chat with Susan B. Martinez, PhD. Uh, Aaron, what did you think there, buddy? That was pretty fun, eh? Yeah, that was fun. That was a good talk. Um, learned some new things. Did you? Yeah. Like what? Well, like a 30 million year old planet. I'm going to have to look into oh, some Oh, you're of stuck on that one, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, I'm a little stuck on that one, but that's besides the point. I'll look into that. So a lot of the stuff she's talking about is, is uh, really interesting, though. Um, I'm definitely going to have to look because you have no, it's definitely something I haven't heard of before, really, as little people. You don't hear much about it. I mean, up until uh, up until we, we talked to Susan, I didn't know much about the subject at all. So it definitely, uh, it definitely lit, lit a little fire for me to go do some digging and, and see what I come up with on my own. Yeah, it's interesting to me about the the uh, Homo florensis. How do you I don't even know how to pronounce that. Um <laughs> Because that's true, right? I mean, that's that's like science-based find, archaeological finds, right? So it's interesting to know how much uh, has been suppressed, if at all, um, just like the giants have. Kind of, you know, are they taking those little bones too to make it sort of seem like there's been less of these little people throughout the throughout our history? Yeah, but if the little people are still around, then uh, what's the difference? Yeah, but see, isn't isn't the little people the way we have them now, they're different than Homo florensis, isn't it? Isn't that a different species altogether? So maybe the little people are like Homo florensis interbreeded with humans. I think so. Like, not humans, but... Well, that's what she figures Homo happened. Reactus. It was all from interbreeding. But yeah, who knows? Anything's possible. In Grimerica. I like the part about the uh, our solar system uh, making its way through... The universe and hitting the radiation belt. Yeah, that yeah. actually was pretty cool. That's uh, definitely some food for thought. I responsible for interest. giantism. Yeah, or responsible for something. Who knows? Evolution. Bark evolution. evolution. No, that's not. No such thing as evolution. No, not Darwinian evolution. On that one, we'll have to agree to disagree. How about the volunteers from up there? No. Anyway, we'd like to thank Susan for coming on. It was a great chat, and uh, I, when her new book comes out, I'd be thrilled to talk to her again and, and see what else she's got to fill us in on. Yeah, interesting to hear about this global cooling thing. So her new book, Out of the Box, will, will be on. Yeah, I've been hearing about that in a few different spots now. Yeah, we have a new P.O. box now, I want to uh, say, right? For postcards or gifts or trinkets or whatever. Do you have it on you? I, I do. It, it's, it's on it's, the website under contact. Yeah, it's on the website, but it's P.O. Box 16033, and that's uh, 815-17th Ave, Southwest Calgary, Alberta. Canada. T2T5H7 is the postal code. Yeah, we actually can get mail care of the show now. The show has its own mailbox. It's a big step. Seems like a big step. It is a big step. It's 2014, and we got our own P.O. Box. So anyway, uh, I don't think uh, I got much else to add. We, uh, we'll see. Uh, it'll be like I say, it'll be a surprise who comes up next. We've definitely got a couple of a uh, couple of names in the works. Some good. It's going to be an interesting spring. So, um, as usual, you'll find links to everything we talked about in the show notes. Where to get Susan's books, um, all that jazz. Everything we talked about in the intro, and of course, what's your Twitter? Acra America. And your email. Acroamerica. <laughs> dot com. Dot com. All right. Yeah, actually, there's a new uh, contact page at the website I updated. So you guys can go there now. You can get in touch with all our bloggers and everyone through the contact page. The mailing address is there. Uh, everything's there. So we're legit. All right. Thanks, buddy. Okay. And of course, uh, all the music you guys heard in the episode, you'll find that in the show notes as well. So. That's about all we got for this week. Have a good week. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you guys next week. It was 8.46 in the morning. And then we heard a plane come over. And in Manhattan, you don't hear planes too often, especially loud ones. Hey.
after all, he claimed he invented the internet. But if he's so smart, how come every internet address begins with W? W? Tell Tony Blair we're going along. 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 Tell Tony, tell, tell Tony. And I saw an airplane hit the tower. The TV was obviously on, and I, I used to fly myself. And I said, well, there's one terrible pilot. And I saw an airplane hit the tower. The TV was obviously on, and I, I used to fly myself. And I said, well, there's one terrible pilot. 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 Terrible fire, 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 terrible fire. Our enemies are innovative and resourceful, and so are we. They never stop thinking about new ways to harm our country and our people, and neither do we. Tell Tony Blair we're going along. Terrible fire, terrible fire, terrible fire, terrible fire, terrible fire, terrible fire. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed Abu Zabeda Ramzi Awar, the guy's name was. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed Abu Zabeda Ramzi Awar, the guy's name was. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed Abu Zabeda Ramzi Awar, the guy's name was. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed Abu Zabeda Ramzi Awar. Terrible pilot, terrible pilot, terrible pilot, terrible pilot, terrible pilot. And so, in my state of the, my state of the union, or state, my speech to the nation, whatever you want to call it, speech to the nation. I asked Americans to give 4,000 years, 4,000 hours over the next, or the rest of your life, of service to America. That's what I asked. I said two, four thousand hours. Because for a century and a half now, America and Japan have formed one of the great and enduring alliances. Because for a century and a half now, America and Japan have formed one of the great and enduring alliances. It'll take time to restore chaos, but we, but we will. It'll take time to restore chaos. But we, but we will. Terrible pilot, terrible pilot, terrible pilot, terrible pilot, terrible pilot. You said we're headed to war in Iraq. I don't know why you say that. I hope we're not headed to war in Iraq. I'm the person who gets to decide, not you. You said we're headed to war in Iraq. I don't know why you say that. I hope we're not headed to war in Iraq. I'm the person who gets to decide, not you. We will not have an all-volunteer army. And yet this week, we will have an all-volunteer army. And yet this week, we will have an all-volunteer army. You're not going to go alone like this president did. To you the tell Tony the Blair we're going alone. Tell Tony Blair we're going alone. Tell Tony... We're not going to go alone like this president did. To you the tell Tony the Blair we're going alone. Tell Tony Blair we're going alone. Tell Tony... I'm honored to uh, shake the hand of a brave Iraqi citizen who had his hand cut off by Saddam Hussein. I saw an airplane hit the tower. The TV was obviously on, and I, I used to fly myself. And I said, well, there's one terrible pilot. And I saw an airplane hit the tower. The TV was obviously on, and I, I used to fly myself. And I said, well, there's one terrible pilot. And I saw an airplane hit the tower. The TV was obviously on, and I, I used to fly myself. And I said, well, there's one terrible pilot. And I saw an airplane hit the tower. The TV was obviously on, and I, I used to fly myself. And I said, well, there's one terrible pilot. If this were a dictatorship, it'd be a heck of a lot easier. <laughs> Just so long as I'm the dick. As long as I'm the dick. As long as I'm the dick.